Ladies and gents, I want to welcome you to uh, this first GeoTalks online event. We hope this is going to be a good way of disseminating some interesting science during lockdown and potentially after that to uh, many people that can't make it to our regular uh, in-person GeoTalks. So thank you for joining us. To those who have joined us, I'm just going to very briefly thank the sponsors. Normally the sponsors are the drinks and snacks, but uh, today the sponsors are the GeoTalk itself, and that is CCIC Coal. And of course, many thanks to John Hancock for all his sponsorship. So this might be your first time attending a Teams live event, and you'll probably realize by now that there is no video of the audience, and so we won't get any video or sound feedback from you. But you are welcome to ask written questions at any time during the presentation. Um, and you can do that by accessing the Q&A chat panel, which should be on the right hand side of your screen. And what we'll do is that we'll publish these questions one by one at the end of the presentation and the presenter will handle them as normal. Of course, to try and get a little bit more interaction uh, throughout the talk right now and later on, you can uh, fill in a little poll related to shale gas so we can get your opinions on some aspects of shale gas. And those links are also available in the Q&A chat panel. So before I introduce the speaker, I just want to pass on uh, our condolences, uh, of course, um, to Martin De Witt and his family, because we sadly learned recently of the passing of Martin De Witt. And of course, as all, you know, as all of you know, Martin De Witt was an absolute legend to South African geosciences and a phenomenal geoscientist and researcher, but also a passionate educator who was really committed and passionate about uplifting South African researchers and students. And so from all of his friends and colleagues at WITS Geosciences and around the country, our thoughts are with uh, Martin De Witt's family at this difficult time. But today, let's move on to a talk that I'm sure Martin would have approved of and would have many things to say. And that is a talk by Stephanie Enslin on shale gas in the Karoo Basin, an opportunity missed or a future prospect. So Stephanie is a lecturer in the School of Geosciences. She joined us a year or two ago after completing her PhD at WITS, looking at an integrated geophysical assessment of the Karoo, and then went on to do a postdoc uh, working on many different aspects of uh, South African geophysics, looking at the bushveld, for instance, as well, in an integrated geophysical sense. And she's now on the staff and at its geoscience is doing some really interesting research, as you'll hear about, but also heading up our teaching um, strategy for the entire school and has been instrumental in making sure that we are getting online and teaching students online during this lockdown. So if you give us one moment, we are just going to change over presentation, so you'll see Stephanie in a moment and not me. OK, Steph, you can share your screen now. Did it work? I've shared it. Uh, it looks like it has worked. Yay! <laughs> so Stephanie, over to you. Um, looks like we have 66 attendees. Wow, I'm impressed. It's fantastic, and it's increasing all the time. So, Steph, I'm going to hand over to you, and uh, everyone enjoy the presentation. Okay. Um, I just wanted to check, are we recording? Yes. We are recording, yes. So this will be uh, available on YouTube afterwards. Okay. Um, I'm very impressed with everybody because um, look how many responses. Although if there's 60 people online, about five people have responded to my mentee polls. So um, Grant has posted the links in, I think, the Q&A section. And so what you can do is you can click on them and you can actually fill in um, your responses. And so the first question I asked here, but uh, there you are is what comes to mind when you hear the words shale gas? And so obviously it's quite difficult giving an online lecture because I'm getting no feedback. I'm literally talking to my computer screen. So I thought this was a great way of forcing you guys to give me feedback, uh, but also to get a sense of who's in the audience, because if the words 
I hate shale gas came up here, I would know to be careful about what I say. And so you can see here some of the words people have said, environmental hazard, energy, fracking, Karoo, controversy, groundwater. So it sounds like um, everyone here is quite knowledgeable about it. Here, yeah, unwanted development, uncertainty, uh, lots of wells, all very true. So the next poll I asked you to fill in was this one over here that says, what was the original 2010, I think it was 2010, estimate of the volume of gas in the Karoo Basin? And this is in TCF. So it seems like the seven, oh, oh, it's gone up, um, people who uh, filled in this poll know a bit about shale gas. And so in a, around 2010, um, I think it was a US organization came and estimated the amount of gas in the basin and they put it at 450 TCF. And I know most of us are from Joburg and we more deal in gold and platinum and what the heck does TCF mean? To put this in, oh, it's gone up to eight. <laughs> to put this in perspective, is the next question. So this is what the original estimate was, 450. I think this was, oh, I'm, I know I looked it up. It was more than that was in the Marcellus shells, possibly, but it was a large amount. People were excited about this amount. The next question I asked you was, what is the current estimate of gas in the Karoo? So we went from 450 in 2010, and I would say maybe I can't actually remember when these dates come, uh, when these new amounts came out, but they being revised constantly. And so I'd say by definitely we had a saga, which is the South African Geophysical Association conference in 2013. And by then these estimates had been revised. And so two people have said 450, four people have said 150 and twen uh, two people have said 20. The correct answer is 20. So this is a very it's a, a the middle of the road figure. I've seen anything from like three to 30. So it was just to show you the orders of magnitude that the amount went down. And this talk will kind of highlight why this change came about. So uh, yeah, it's now down around 20. And then the last question I asked you is kind of you answering this talk. So we might as well all just go home then. I said, what do you think uh, Karoo shale gas is. So the first option is a future prospect, which five people have voted on. Second one, a lost opportunity, two people. And I'm glad for the honesty, two people said I didn't want shale gas anyway. <laughs> so I hope you don't hate me after this talk. Um, and yeah, I, I think by the end of this talk, I'll just be able to suggest a way forward. And it will depend on a lot of factors, whether it becomes the blue curve or the blue bar or the pink bar. OK, glad another the sixth person has voted for a future prospect. OK, well, let me start up my uh, PowerPoint. OK, and just to give you some background on this talk, it was actually one I gave at the South African Geophysical Association conference last year, October in Durban. And it was trying to kind of summarize where we were on the Karoo, because it seems at the moment we're not going any further. Um, so what have we done so far, but also just realizing so many people are doing so many different things and not always speaking to each other. So it was trying to give a summary for everybody on who is doing what. And so you can see other people who read through the abstract for the conference, uh, Nick Bukas, Michael de Kock and Nicola Wagner at um, UJ uh, involved with Mira or Chimera um, were also involved in this and Sue has been my supervisor all along for my PhD. And so as Grant said, I just wanted to at the start, possibly even just dedicate this talk to Martin DeWitt. So he in 2010 wrote this paper, The Great Shale Debate in the Karoo. And I think it was what I learned the most from about the Karoo. And also, I just think he's been doing pioneering work. He's now, he was based at Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University, and they had a great effort going into the farms in the Karoo, trying to educate the farmers on how to collect groundwater samples and test them so that they could create a baseline database. So that if fracking went ahead and something went wrong, the farmers had some data to stand on and accuse companies, which we hope would never happen, um, which is something that people in America didn't have. And so I just think he's he's developed a real integrated team at NMMU, uh, which is now called E.ON. Uh, previously, he led up in Carver, and they've just been studying the crew for a long time. So really, most of the stuff I've learned here was from him. And Grant, he definitely would argue with me about stuff I say. <laughs> Martin always argues. <laughs> 
And so for anyone who's not sure about shale gas, um, what's the difference between, you can see here, conventional and unconventional. I think if you're a hard rock person up in Joburg, you know, like I said, about gold and diamonds and platinum, you don't maybe know so much about gas. Um, on the left-hand side here, it's got um, a conventional gas. So this is gas that would have escaped from the rock, been trapped by this gray seal, and then we will drill down and pump out the gas. And this is obviously what is done most places around the world, whereas now shale gas, this brown layer is the shale layer, and what you're doing is you're drilling down, you're going horizontally, you're fracking, so you're setting off small explosions to break up the rock so that the gas trapped inside the shale can escape up. Something to remember is they're pumping down water, and they're pumping down sand to try to keep the fractures open, and they don't just frack once, they frack multiple times to keep these fractures open to help the gas escape. And so this is obviously what freaked out everybody about the crew. But this is the difference between conventional and unconventional gas. Um, I was going to say, sorry, we should have said at the start, uh, Grant was going to keep questions to the end, but if there's anything that comes up along the way, please message Grant and Grant, you're welcome to interrupt me and ask the question. And so I think what Martin said and what many people feel is that in South Africa, shale gas is not the answer because the final answer should be renewables if we can ever get to that point. But it was definitely going to be a stepping stone to a place that was cleaner than coal. Um, and so it's supposed to be 50% cleaner than coal. I have heard people complain that if shale gas escapes or the methane escapes into the atmosphere, it will undo any good that it ever did. Um, and something else to remember in South Africa is I think our political and social ties to coal are huge. So shale gas would never replace it um, if we had enough, but it definitely was meant to be the stepping stone to a cleaner um, environment. And so moving on to the geology, I'm sure most people in the audience will know where the Karoo Basin is. This is in case we have some students in the audience. And um, you can see this large blue area here is the Karoo Basin covers, I think, around 70,000 square kilometers of South Africa, so a huge part of South Africa. But there's also Karoo-aged rocks throughout Southern Africa. You can see um, throughout these regions. So this was just to put it in context of Southern Africa. And then looking at the rocks themselves, um, you all would have learned in undergrad, you've got this yellow dwaka around the edge, which is a glacial tillite. You've got this orange here, which is the Eka group, which is a large amount of shales, especially in the southern part of the basin. And if I'm not wrong, coals up in the north here. Um, and this is where the shale gas, they were going to look for it in a formation called the White Hill Formation. The Prince Albert Formation also is a possible source. Then we move here into the Beaufort, where you've got more sandstones. Here's the Stormberg. And then this purple here, which should also cover the Sutu, but it's blanked out. Um, are the lavas of the Drakensberg group. And so these lavas erupted at the end of the basin formation, and we had sills and dikes intruding within the basin, which I'll tell you more about later. Just out of interest state, sake, these red dots here and these black dots here are actually gas escape features that we see. And it's thought that it's from sills coming into contact with the shale layer and causing these explosive releases to surface. Um, and so we've been busy looking at a seismic line that possibly images one of these. So, so this is just the geology. Something to keep in mind about the White Hill Formation, and I have a feeling people didn't keep it in mind when they initially estimated the gas, was they calculated for the entire basin, but the White Hill Formation is really just in the southern part and it pinches out between Herzogville and Coffee Bay. So it's not in this northern part up here. You will see there are some companies that have prospecting rights around here, but if I'm not, um, I hope I'm correct, they actually for coal bed methane here. So there no, would be no shell gas up in this region. So some important dates to remember is that this all started in 2010. This was when the interest um, peaked, and thankfully it was when I started my PhD, so it was very good timing. This is a bit of a blurred out plot at the bottom, but this is oil prices. So here's 2000, here's 2010, here's where we are today, and you can see we're going from $20 a barrel up to 160, and unfortunately down again over here. So in 2010, which was about here, you can see oil prices were high. 2011, the government put a moratorium in place on further exploration. And so this, I think, came out of 
um, a lot of tension around Shell and farmers in the Karoo. And in the end, I think government realized it was safer to just put things on pause until they could get educated enough about what was shale gas so that we didn't get taken for a ride by these companies. And so we sent a lot of scientists overseas to learn, and I think a lot of people built up knowledge. And then in 2012, I'm told the moratorium was lifted, but there were no license grant, licenses granted. Um, more on this now. 2011 to 2013, oil was around $100 a barrel. So you can see here, this is the $100 a barrel price and oil prices were up here. And I think when I was ignorant, I thought, oh, people who look for shale gas are in opposition to oil companies. No, it turns out the people looking for shale gas are the oil companies. So if you've got oil at over $100 a barrel, you've got cash to spend on these operations of looking for gas that might not be there. You can afford to spend. Um, but we all know what happened. In 2014, we had a major drop in the oil price. You can see here in the middle, it's gone below $40 a barrel. And so at this point in time, a lot of operations stopped. And 2015, when I was coming to the end of my PhD and hoping to get a job in the oil company, in the oil, yeah, in an oil company in South Africa, Shell was pulling out of the Shell gas team in South Africa. And I think the poor lead geologist landed up going to Siberia. I think I would prefer to be in Cape Town. And so, <clears throat> sorry. Um, and so from what I've read, where we are today is that they're not handing out any new licenses but they're busy processing old licenses. And so I'll show you a map later on, who, on who's got these applications. Um, the guys at Sayoga, which is the South African Oil and Gas Alliance, I'm sure can give you way more information. That is what I understand um, today. And that's also a disclaimer on this talk. This talk is what I understand. Maybe I've missed something or maybe something has changed. Please let me know afterwards. Okay, and so kind of how I see it and a lot of people's opinions is that companies are not going to invest in shale gas in South Africa until our oil prices rise. And if we go back here, I, see, I think I read an article about the fact that oil prices were going to go negative at some point, but we've passed that. I think they're sorting out the issues, uh, but it's, it's crashed quite severely, so we need oil prices to rise. And one of the major issues was that we need a petroleum bill. And so what happened was then when the mining charter came out in 2016, 2017, they lumped in oil and gas into that charter. And I think that made people very nervous because you've got things like BEE um, quotas, but a lot of the oil companies are not South African based and there's not, yeah, you know, there aren't um, like smaller oil companies to join with. So they were quite worried about this. And so what has happened since then is it was the oil and gas stuff was removed from the mining charter and made into its own legislation, which I know was supposed to be coming out soon. I haven't been following that. So this is just where we are currently with shale gas. And I told this to a bunch of engineers recently who are trying to develop a shale gas plant in the crew, and they were all very despondent. <laughs> but I think we mustn't lose hope. Um, but since we're all geologists, we don't care so much about the politics. Let's move on to, well, what do we actually know about the geology of the basin? Because I think it was Martin who said, if nothing else by the end of this, let us use this opportunity and the money from big companies to see what's there. Like, we don't really know what's there in the Karoo. We don't have the money to go look as academics. Let's use this opportunity to learn. And I think we have learned a lot. And so something we've learned is about the things that influence the amount of gas in the basin. So there's several things that are going to mature the shale rock to the point of either producing gas or making the gas burn off and disappear. And so one of them is burial depth. How deep are the shales being buried? Another thing which we'll look at is the Cape Fold Belt. How has that affected the shales? And mainly what I focus my studies on are the dolerites within the basin. So before 2010, most of the work that had been done looking for oil and gas in the basin was in the 1960s, 1970s. This was done by Sukor, um, the state uh, oil company, which as far as I understand, then split into Petros A and the Petroleum Agency. And so this image I'll go into detail just now, but this, a lot of this data was data they collected, the red triangles and these black seismic lines. And they found that there was increasing maturity of the, um, the shales towards the south due to increased burial, which is um, you'll see in the depth map later on. They did say that in the lower echo shales, there was 
um, dry gas. And the reason why they said this was because at well CR1-68, they had a gas show. So CR, I don't think it's labeled on here, it's one of these wells down here in the south. So it actually had gas coming out of it. And Bundu um, is the one oil company, they've actually taken their license over CR168. So this is what we had. Um, this is the type of data we were looking at. So this is a table from uh, Rouse and de Swart, which I think all of us refer to. They had these great maps on changing maturity. And this is some of the seismic data they had. Um, if Musa, if you're listening, we've definitely improved on our seismic data. So Jan Fatty did a lot of work on it and published it for his thesis. And so I remember going to um, the Saga conference in 2011 and meeting one of the guys from Falcon Oil and Gas. And so that he was one of the guys who had a, uh, sorry, one of the companies who had a license in the Karoo. And he showed a similar image with all these black lines. And I thought we had maybe one or two seismic lines in the Karoo that we had data from Jan Fatty's thesis. And he was like, uh uh, they have paid for all of these lines to be digitized. So they were on reams. Um, I assume paper reams or tapes. I don't know what tapes are. I keep on getting told about them, but I'm too young to know what they are. Um, and they had been digitized and these were all now electronic. And thankfully, I was at the Council for Geoscience at the time and we worked out a data agreement and we got all of the seismic data, which otherwise would have been lost. And so these red triangles, that are, as I mentioned, um, are Council for Geoscience wells along with other wells that Doug Cole, who's worked in the Karoo and has done a brilliant job, um, was able to get this data. The wells that were um, mentioned in Rouse and de Swart's paper are mainly these lower triangles here. And some of these, well, the boreholes or the wells, went to five kilometers. They must have cost a fortune. These blue triangles up here are from Anthony Rutherford's thesis. I think they were Anglo um, wells. And then these green lines here, um, were I'm just trying, uh, refraction seismic lines through Martin de Witt's um, in Kabi, Africa. These orange lines here were seism seismic lines, um, also through in Kaba, and I think Africa Ray, Ray can prove me right or wrong, and then some offshore lines as well. So we had a bit of data in the Karoo, um, and that was the starting point. And so I used all the data and was able to create this depth map. So this is to the top of the White Hill Formation. And so you can see we're in Joburg up here, down here is Cape Town, um, Coffee Bay is on the right hand side here. I think uh, I'm gonna lie if I know if SP is by East London or PE, excuse my bad geography. Um, and what you can see here is that your shallowest depths are these whites and these browns um, up here. You can see there's a positive depth because this is depth below topography. So for example, if your topography is at 1,200, this over here is 100 meters below um, surface level. And so in the south here, you can see these blues, we're getting to more than five kilometers depth, but quite interestingly over here, it's a bit shallow in this region. So I'm not gonna talk about that today. It is in one of our papers. So you can see this deepening and these depth values here fit in with the fact that you get dry, um, sorry, you get gas produced if something is buried to five kilometers depth. So you can see this is a depth chart uh, and a the temperatures. Yeah. Here it tells you whether you will get kerogen, oil or gas produced. So it is in that window. The question which Zubair, if you're listening, you can answer for us is what is the burial history been? Has it gone up and down and up and down? No. Um, yeah, that is the complication. So the, the main thing is we have the possibility here that it is deep enough to have gas. No. Okay. okay else that I mentioned was the Cape Fold Belt. We've got amazing folds in the south. How has this affected the gas? This is a cross section. You can see up here is Joburg going down to George. In the south, uh, we've got this Cape Fold Belt. Um, uh, the folding of the rocks, you've got, this is the Cape Supergroup over here, and this is the Karoo Supergroup. And the bending of those rocks has obviously heated up the shale layer, which is this orange layer. And so we're not expecting to find any shales um, in this region to the south. Um, Martin de Witt's one student, Claire, um, did a study of a borehole in this region and showed such um, data. And then the interesting part in my mind are the dollarites. And so again, a picture I've got online, um, Mainly, I wanted to show you this lower image here that we talk about sills and dikes, and I think that often makes us see individual bodies. 
but we need to keep in mind that it's actually this complicated network down here um, of that is completely interconnected. I think very often people have thought about dikes feeding up into the sills. A lot of people nowadays are talking about sills feeding sills, um, but the main thing to, is to realize it's a very complicated network that is going to be quite difficult to drill in and not hit a dollarite. And so this is just a shape file of all of the sills in the basin. So you can see this black outline here is the basin. You got sills in most of it. Um, these are dolerite dikes, and this was actually taken from oh, uh, Luc Chevalier. Sorry, his work. He actually digitized all of these dikes. I think there's definitely something missing out up here. Um, but yeah, tons of dikes in the basin. So how is this going to affect the shale gas? Well, you can see this black outline here is the basin, and these are all boreholes in the basin. And these red boreholes here, or these red triangles, are where you've got more than 150 meters of dolerite within a borehole. Um, in some places, if you've got like a two kilometer deep borehole, you've got 600 meters worth of dolerite in those boreholes. So in these parts of the basin, you've got huge amounts of dolerite. In these green uh, boreholes here, or wells, you've got less than 150 meters of dolerite. This is more towards the center of the basin. And then towards the, in the blue wells here, you've got no dolerites. And this is because of something I'll mention just now is called the dolerite line. South of this line, there are no dolerites. And it's still debated why we have this line. Um, but also the problem, well, you might say to me, oh, let's go drill here. Well, the problem is you're actually getting to the edge of the Cape Fold belt, so then you're getting the impact due to folding. So you can see this quite nicely in cross section at the bottom. These wells are on the eastern side, these two wells, sorry, on the western side, these two wells on the eastern side, and these three are the green wells in the middle. And in the red wells, not only is there a lot of dolerite, but it's everywhere. It's not just in the Beaufort or the Eka or the Dwaika, it is everywhere. You can see throughout. Whereas in these green wells, there's less dolerite, and it's also completely um, concentrated in the Beaufort. And so you're not getting anything down here. ES is the Eka shales. Um, and you can see how much deeper it goes in this region. So there's, this gives us hope that this is going to help when we're looking for shale gas. Something to keep in mind, though, is we're still going to have to drill through these dolerites to get down to the shale layer. And that obviously creates some worry about contamination and gas escaping um, through fractures linked with these dolerites. But it will obviously be mitigated by having good casing of our wells. I just wanted to show you what some of the seismic data looks like um, and why we obviously need new seismic data. So this was some of the data that Falcon Oil and Gas digitized. So this is the 1960s, 1970s data um, that Jan Fatty looked at. And so this, sorry, on the left hand side is geology. So the green is Beaufort and um, the yellow is Cenozoic sediments. This pink that's not that clear is actually the dolerites. And this black line is the seismic line. So to help, I've put these red arrows every time it goes over a dolerite. Question is, is it a sill? Um, or I would suggest they're actually sheets, and I'll show you on the seismics. This map here shows us where we are. It's this seismic line in the eastern side of the basin. You can see here is well CR, which is where they had the gas show. And this is the magnetic data. The fun part of the magnetic data is that you're right near the BT anomaly, so it complicates things. But you can see here this east-west trending um, dolerite. You can see a little bit over here, and there's another east-west trending dolerite within this blue. And you can actually see them quite well on the seismic. So on the seismic, you just need to get your eye in. This strong reflector at the base here is your basement. So it's going from Cape Supergroup to the basement, and it's this contrast in rock properties that gives us a strong reflection. The other strong reflection here is this one here, and that is labeled as Eka Shales, um, and it's a bit of a debate, is it the shales or is the White Hill? But I've argued it is the White Hill formation. And so, yeah, this is your white hill formation that has quite a low velocity, and that's how it comes, it shows up as a strong reflector. These other reflectors down here are Cape Supergroup rocks. And then the interesting thing to see are these shallower dolerites. And so these reds here correlate exactly with these reds on the geological map. 
So we know on surface there is dolerite, and they correlate, you can see, with this strong reflector going downward and joining up with a deeper horizontal reflector. Not so easy to see this middle one, but there is a bit of a strong reflector, and this strong reflector here comes up to this red point. So that's what um, people call sheets. So a dolerite sheet is on the edge of a sill, and so it comes up at an angle to surface. It's a debate whether this is actually a sill or just a multiple. So when you have these very um, dense high velocity bodies in the um, shallow crust, they, they make it difficult for energy from the seismics to go down. And so often you're not always seeing a body, but you're actually seeing repeats from shallower bodies. But we definitely are seeing these dipping sheets. And I try to model it here on the magnetics. Something to keep in mind, and I forget to do every time I do a seismic talk, is your vertical exaggeration. So from the start of the line here is zero, and we're going to 60 kilometers um, on the right-hand side of the line here. Your depth is only going to 11 kilometers. So this is heavily vertically exaggerated, and I don't want to give you the impression that these sheets are very steep. They're actually very gently dipping, um, I think usually less than 20 degrees dip. So this is heavily vertically exaggerated. This should be stretched out a lot more towards the right hand side of this, the um, slide. Something else to highlight is that a lot of oil companies, if I go back here, <coughs> sorry, um, think that this magnetic data that I showed you up in this top right is going to be sufficient to study these dolerites. Dolerites um, very often are magnetic, although there are some that aren't, and they're hoping to use this regional go uh, government data from the Council for Geoscience that has line spacings of one kilometer. But I was lucky enough at the Council um, to look at some of the higher res, higher res um, data on the right-hand side here. So left-hand side is the government data that was flown uh, from the 1960s to 1990s, somewhere around there, so you can correct me. And you can see the poor resolution. And the whole point of the study was to get regional structures. So it served its purpose. And we now need to go and fly high res data. And I know the council is doing a great job at the moment to fly new surveys. And so on the right hand side was a newer database, which I think was flown in 2001, had smaller line spacing of about 250 meters. And instead of a flight out of 150 meters, the, the plane was much lower at 80 meters. And you can see how much more detail you're seeing. Um, on the right, left hand side here, you're seeing some of the linear features, but you really are missing this southwest to northeast trending dark swarm, which is this red, sorry, yellow, yellow lines in this top geological map were completely missed on this other aeromag data. And so we've just been trying to show this to companies to say they have to fly new data. Um, and I know David Koza at the uh, Council for Geoscience is also saying we need to fly electromagnetics because some of these dots aren't magnetic, but they do um, are conductive so, or resistive. <laughs> um, so we need to fly multiple surveys to help us map these. And then just briefly, um, moving on to the dolerite line here, mainly because we would love to have everyone's opinion. This line, black line here is the Cape Fold Belt and going from west to east. And these pink gray bodies here are the dolerites. And you can see in the west, they're quite far north. And as you go towards the east, they get closer and closer to the dolerite line. And it's mainly these long, thin dolerites, which are actually these sheets coming up from depth. And so a paper which we really need to publish and do more work on is why is there this change? And I would suggest that it's actually because how the basement changes. So, or how the basin, sorry, the layers within the basin dip. So in the west here, which is this side here where the dolerites are far away from the Cape Cod belt, you've got the basin's not that deep, but it quite quickly uh, deepens. It's got quite a steep um, downward dip. Whereas on the eastern side, which is here where the dolerites have intruded further south, the basin gets a hang of a lot deeper, um, but it's quite a gradual deepening. And so maybe that has allowed the dolerites um, to intrude further um, south. So this is something we need to look in more detail about. 
One last thing to mention on the dollar runs before I summarize um, what different people have been doing in the field of shale gas is something to keep in mind with these dolerites is that they have multiple fracture zones associated with them along the edges. So sorry for the low res um, image. You don't have so many fractures in the middle, but on the edges and where they've touched the boundary rock, there's fractures there. And so the concern is that this is where gas and water will escape and we've got possible contamination of the much shallower groundwater. And so this is the reason why we actually need to know where these dolerites are, what are they doing, how are they connected, how are their fracture networks connected. And it's not going to be an easy task, um, but this is the reason why we need to do it to make sure we can frack safely. And this, uh, okay, this is a, a map of the sweet spot, which you'll often hear people talk about. I've said that I've got it from the council website. I know the petroleum agency has one, um, several different people have sweet spots, but the main thing that it takes into account and it maps this blue region is where we actually think we're gonna be able to get shell gas and extract it safely. And so it depends on multiple um, parameters, which I don't know all of them, but I know several, <coughs> sorry, three of them are what I've mentioned already. Depends on the depth in the basin. It depends on the impact of the Cape Fault belt. It depends on the dolerites. You can see it's in this region where I showed you those green wells where there's not that much dolerite. Um, and so this would be the area to focus on. And so, just to draw your attention, because I don't think I moved it later, in the west here is Beaufort West. Um, and that is actually where the council is focusing at the moment on doing um, studies into the shale gas, and it's within this blue region. And so possibly I should have shown you at the beginning, but the main aim is to compare these two images. These are the companies that have taken licenses. And so the main thing here we've got in the south, Falcon Oil and Gas, these were the guys who digitized the seismic data. Um, I think it has been brought out by Chesapeake, I could be wrong. Shell has this large area in the north. Um, this is Sunset Energy, I don't know if that's the same thing as Undu, but I assume it is because it's around this well um, CR over here. And you can see your sweet spot over here is probably going to be in this region around here. So they and um, these companies, I think, took large license areas um, to play it safe, but this will be possibly the area that they will focus. Um, and so this talk was also a point of just highlighting who's doing what. This isn't very long. I know I'm reaching the end of um, near the end of my time. So it was just as I've said, Martin De Witt at E.ON, which is the African Earth Observatory Network, has been doing a lot of work on the Karoo. And it's really a multi multidisciplinary project. And I think it's a call for all of us to get out of our silos, which is the new catchphrase. So don't stick in your geology bubble, your geophysics bubble. We need to expand. And they had PhD students in, <coughs> uh, I'm just trying to think. It was the social sciences. They had guides going out there to speak to um, poor people in the community about how they thought shale gas was going to um, change their lives. So as well as looking at the geology side, and I think it, it tells all of us that we've got to look at all these aspects when you're doing science. We can't just stick, stick to the, um, the calculations and the equations. And so um, what Ian was able to do, they drilled a borehole down here. This was the one I mentioned earlier that showed the impact of the Cape Fold Belt. Um, but yeah, they've been doing a ton of other work in this region. And just so you know, on this right hand side, this is one of the seismic lines that they collected in the 90s over here towards the western side. Um, so they have a wealth of data. And I know Mokhtar at Ian is going to carry on with the great work that Martin was doing. Oh, this is a zoom in on that seismic data, and this is one of the refraction seismic lines that they also had. You can see, if I scroll back, it went a little bit on the eastern side here, and this red region here is the um, slower rocks of the Karoo Basin. And one of the things they were trying to look at is the BT magnetic anomaly here. They thought that it had higher velocities. They also did a magnetotelluric survey over the BT along the same line to show that it actually had um, conductivity anomalies and also show that the white hill formation within the Karoo is, is very conductive and you could use MT to map it. So this was just some of the previous work that they've done. 
The other guys doing great work is the Petroleum Agency. Um, John Decker used to be there um, and we connected with him. And now I know Sean Johnson's doing a, a great job just leading the team. And this is a section that they produce. And I think it really helps put in perspective what we are going to see in the Karoo. So there's your little well pad up at the top and you're drilling all the way down here to the, to the White Hill Formation. They've got it between three and four kilometers depth and you've got all these dollarites along these way, these, the, these red lines. So it's going to be complicated, um, but I think we're up to the challenge. And this is just a map of some of the data they've had that um, you can go check out their website. Not so easy to see, but here's the seismic data, or the seismic lines I showed you. Um, they've got control of the data and will be managing it. Um, and obviously this offshore region is now the hot topic now that Total had the gas fine. But I just wanted to zoom in on this eastern part of the Karoo here, which I think is going to be the next interesting part um, of the Karoo if we can get some data. So here is Lesotho, here's Port Shepston, East London, Port Elizabeth, no, I think that's Port Elizabeth down there. And so this yellow here is the edge of the current shale gas licenses, and you can see the seismic lines, but you can see here several long seismic lines that were never digitized because Falcon didn't have those areas. And these lines are going to be great to look at just to understand the basin because this area here, the basin deepens significantly and we don't know too much about it because there's not, no wells down here because it's not the easiest place to get into. I must admit I've looked at one of these seismic lines and it looks terrible. <laughs> um, the data, I think the problem is you've got a lot of dollarites here, so it's going to be hard to see under. Um, I've had confirmation from Petro SA that they also think the data is terrible, so it wasn't just me. But there's a few lines that would be interesting to look at them and see if we can get something out. Also, I mean, you're starting to get over the BT anomaly here. Can you see anything of the deeper crustal structures that might be wishful thinking? Another group that's been doing great work, Samira or Chimera, as we call it at WITS, um, has they. Um, started, well, they supervised the Car Karen project, Karen project, sorry. We all seem to pronounce things differently. <laughs> um, and what happened there is Shell gave them um, money to go and drill um, academic boreholes and or wells. And I think everyone was skeptical initially that Shell had ulterior motives, but they really just left it up to the academics to choose where they wanted to drill. And so two wells were drilled, one over here in the Eastern Cape, um, and one here in the Western Cape. This well, KZF, showed the effect of the Cape Fold Belt on the shales. And this well in the Eastern side confirmed how much the basin deepens here. It's a lot deeper than would be expected. So, yeah, and you can see this dashed line here is with um, the sweet spot is that they've mapped in the middle. So Karen, they've published some of the results. I've just put one of the papers here with um, Michael de Kock. And so just, again guarding, uh, reminding us to be careful about how much gas we estimate is in the basin. House of Geosciences, I'm sorry you have a bank site. <laughs> um, I always want to put something here but I'm always, um, I, I couldn't find anything online so one of the council guys will have to speak to us afterwards. I mentioned to you where Beaufort West is and I actually meant to put the map here so huge apologies but the council has got a great project that they're running there they've collected new um, aeromag data they've drilled wells they're hopefully going to be able to drill a super deep borehole I don't know if um, there was talk of a seismic line I don't know if it will go ahead so this blank space is to say watch this space because I think there's going to be exciting data coming out of the council at a time where nobody else is currently doing much drilling in the Karoo. So I think the space is going to be filled with some great images in the near future. I know I'm working with Mpume Dubi at the council who's looking at the Aeromag data and it's really great quality data. So keep up the good work guys. Also just wanted to highlight to you that two scientific reports were written on the Karoo. And so this links in with the fact that government wanted South African scientists to just better understand shale gas so we could advise government. So the Academy of Science of South Africa and uh, Cyril O'Connor wrote a report uh, titled The South African Technical Readiness to Support the Shale Gas Industry with many leading researchers contributing. I've put the link here if you want to go check it out. It's free to download. 
There was also another report written. Uh, it was a collaboration between government, CSR and CGS, which is the council, and Bob Scholes, and it included our very own Prof. Ray Durham looking at the micro seismics in the Karoo, titled Shale Gas Development in the Second Central Karoo, a Scientific Assessment of the Opportunities and Risk. Again, a great um, resource that they provided and it's free to download. And more importantly for us younger generation who are not particularly good about reading long things, um, Prof Scholes actually came and did a saga talk at the Geophysical Association and we've got his YouTube video here. And it was just so great to have um, Bob who's more into the environmental nature side of things and his perspective on shell gas. So please go check out that video when you've run out of all other YouTube videos during lockdown. And so just a way forward in my mind, and I think in other people's minds from what I've spoken about, is that I'm just trying to think when it was. It was maybe 2017. It was when this ASIF report was launched or it was starting. And there was a big workshop in PE and someone in the audience stood up and said, we're quite tired of talking about shale gas. Can't we just go drill a well? And at our meeting last year, I think the same opinion came out that we've been talking about this for so long that maybe we're talking about something that's not there and we're wasting so much time and money having conferences. We just need to go and drill some wells and see if there's actually this gas there that we're hoping is there. Because all of this old data is from the 1960s, 1970s. We need to be able to analyze it with new technology. And so obviously the problem there is the high cost of this type of drilling. The only people that can afford it are the big companies. People are skeptical of the big companies. Academics don't have the money to do it. So we need something similar to what happened with the Karin project, where you've got the big oil companies coming in, donating money and academics drilling. And so I've said industry donations through Sioga, so South African Oil and Gas Alliance has great industry connections and can connect um, the right academics with the right industry. And then an uh, umbrella body like Samira, obviously because it's in Joburg and closer to me, or something like E.ON, just an umbrella organization that can collaborate with CGS and we can all work together to get some data out, but also in the same time facilitate talent development. And um, Prof. Ray Durham at WITS is now heading up a community of practice for oil and gas. And so this would all fit in well with that so that we're not all going in our own directions, trying to get data, but rather working towards this common goal. Um, but as I said earlier, nobody's really prepared to take this step until oil prices increase and government finalizes legislation. So this is in the future we think stabilize, which right at the moment the future is anything but stable. Um, but ultimately when we get to that point we need um, future exploration, we need some large scale seismic data. Uh, from what I've heard we can't have 3D seismics in the Karoo because of the flora and fauna, so it would be 2D seismics, um, but we need this data to better understand what is going on, so hopefully the CGS seismic line can go ahead. High resolution magnetic data, as I said, I should also add electromagnetic data here, which ultimately will ensure safe fracking, and so we don't land up like a situation in America. Um, but to keep in mind that if all of this goes ahead tomorrow, we're still going to be only going to have the infrastructure in place to harness the gas on a large scale in 20 years. So we can't, I think, yeah, we've got to realize this is going to take a while to develop, so we've got to get cracking, um, at least to just see what is in the ground. And I suppose something I, sh I think that's my last, sh okay, so let's say, I'll summarize here, just is the shale gas in the career an opportunity missed or a future prospect? Mm -hmm. I think if all the factors come into place, it's definitely a future prospect if we can just drill a well and figure out if there's actually anything there. And I think a good thing and a bad thing that has possibly paralyzed South Africa is what came out of America, is you had situations where there was concerns that groundwater was um, being contaminated. You had reports of fracking fluids with arsenic in it. But we just need to realize that we are looking at putting legislation in place to hold companies accountable so we won't have to worry about these things. In America, they didn't have to disclose what they were putting in the fracking fluids. That wouldn't be the case in South Africa. Um, companies would need to be held to account. I know a lot of you will say, 
sometimes corruption gets in the way of that. But I think we've got a lot of proof of success. For example, I'm going to say Anglo was doing, is it coal bed methane fracking um, in the coal fields and everything was fine and there weren't any problems. So I think the problem is South Africans, we like the devil we know rather than the devil we don't know. And the devil we know is coal <laughs> and we don't want to move away from it. And I think this could be a great future prospect. Just to highlight something that came out of the meeting last year when I said everyone was doing something but nobody knew what anybody else was doing. We started this blog site. Don't be put off by the fact it's a blog. It's really just a collection of who's doing what. And so it says who's who. There's an overview of information. We started a Google Drive with um, stuff that can be shared legally just so that at least when researchers start a project on the Karoo, they're not starting from scratch. They can go and use this resource. So this was to help people stay connected and hopefully to encourage people listening here that in whatever project you work on, collaboration is key and just, um, I think, going into a future of information management so people can find things and just have better ideas going forward. And I'm going to stop there. I just added that in at the end. Um, Ron, sorry for going so long. <laughs> Thank you so much. Keep your keep your slides um, up there because um, okay. we have some questions which have come through. So okay. thank you everyone for listening so attentively. But first of all, thank you, Steph, for an absolutely fantastic presentation and being willing to uh, experiment with this new Geo GeoTalk format. So thanks, Grant, Steph. But I'm can, gonna, now. can I just say, I actually thoroughly enjoyed it because any time I talk on shale gas, I'm always scared I'm going to have tomatoes thrown at me. <laughs> so nobody <laughs> could throw anything at me now. <laughs> Well, we do have yes. some questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm start scared. publishing yeah. some of the questions. And, and for the audience, I'm going to repeat some of the questions so that the people that watch this on YouTube later um, will hear the questions because they won't see the Q&A which you are seeing. So we're going to I start. I don't have it on my screen, so it is easy if you can read it because otherwise I'd have to close my PowerPoint. Yeah. So we're going to start with the first question from Tony Long. Um, are the pseudo coals in the southern Beaufort evidence of gas developed in the Ecker below? Hmm. I can honestly say I have absolutely no idea. I can find out for you. Um, one thing I can say is that most people think a lot of gas has escaped from the basin. I know there's some guys in Nor it's either Norway or Sweden speaking about gas from the Karoo and other basins being linked to global warming. So it is highly likely that gas, what is most likely, gas has escaped from the Eka and moved to other places. Okay, and then the next question from Francis. Um, thank you, Francis, for your question. Under the circumstances we have, moratoriums, lack of funds, etc., uh, with available seismic in the Karoo, is it better to drill a few boreholes or prioritize acquisition of a few 2D seismic lines? I'm a geophysicist, so I'm going to be biased <laughs> in my answer. Seismics is always important. Um, I think. Uh, I would argue for seismics will help you place your borehole better. Um, I know seismics is expensive, but well drilling is also hangover expensive. Um, but that's also a big 3D seismic service. So I, I don't know. I would argue for some seismics <laughs> and okay. well drilling. Sorry, you're going to have to do both. All right. Then another question from Anonymous here. Why would the change in basement deepening between east and west change the dollarite distribution? A very good question. This is just a summation, uh, assumption on my part. Um, the main reason why I'm arguing it, and you'll see my hands going up, and I should have mentioned it earlier, is these dolerites like to go along the layering, these sills. The sills go between the layers and they particularly like the edge of the white gel. They love to intrude along the white gel. And so my question would be, if the layer starts getting very deep like this, very steep, the sill's not going to keep going down along this layer. It's just going to say, this is too much work. I'm going to come up to surface. Whereas if there's a very, a lot more gentle dip, I think the sill would keep going, keep going, and then come up further south. That's my very non-scientific explanation of what I think it is, but it needs to be discussed further. There's, there hasn't been much work done on the dollar outline. Okay, so um, here's another question uh, from John Hancock. So first of all, John, thank you for sponsoring these virtual geo talks. Much appreciated. And uh, I'm sure everyone's clapping right now. 
Um, <laughs> And so John's John is the Karoo is, expert, so I don't know if I could ever answer John's question. Your, he knows everything. <laughs> yes. Your thoughts on basin development and whether the lower echo in the north actually has any potential? I do not have an opinion, John. <laughs> I've completely just focused on the south. I would love to know your opinion. I don't have any opinion on this. I mean, all I know is what the companies are doing, and they're all looking at coal bed methane. So I would assume that's the only potential up that side. OK, and then Sorry. we have a comment from Thomas. It's a little bit of a long comment, but that's OK. I can read it out if you can't see it, Steph. The Eastern Karoo area, where you pointed out no data, uh, from my understanding, is that the echo or white hill is thinning out and outcropping to surface, which will not be conducive for shale gas. So geological studies in that area is much needed first. This is something that mm. university can help with with students and research. A uh, very good point. I mean, the main question is, and I'm going to have to go all the way back, where is Coffee Bay? Um, sorry, if we can't find it too quickly. So Coffee Bay is over here. So the, everybody says, but often that's just uh, people don't always question it. So White Hill should be pinching out between here and here. Some of the seismic data from the petroleum agency is over um, further south, so we might be able to pick it up. So the region I'm saying we need to go study a bit more is in this region here, just south of Lesotho before it comes up to surface. Because if I'm correct, Karen drilled one of their wells down here where it gets a lot deeper. So, I mean, you've definitely got to plan your survey quite well, Thomas. It's a good point of getting it before it outcrops on surface. Um, you can see it shallows quite a, a bit here. But something to keep in mind with this map, which I didn't point out earlier, this is all just interpolation. This isn't actual depth values. There's depth values here and there's depth values here and everything else between it is interpolated. So this is where we need to go fill in data. So good point, Thomas, but I think we should look in this area over here. Okay, and then if Steph, if you're keen for one or two more questions, maybe two more, there's sure. a question here um, from Anonymous. How do we maintain some kind of integrity wall and publish the factual results, even if they are not aligned with the bottom line of the private sector contributors? Um, a very good point. Um, I think a lot of scientists so far have been quite willing to say there's nothing in the Karoo. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the current, so from what I understand, your question is saying we want to highlight if there's not going to be stuff that we want to say, there's not stuff that we don't want to keep industry um, tow towing them along. Is that correct, Grant? Is that your? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, and make sure that the information is factual and based on evidence. Mm. Well, I think the best way to do that is um, how scientists are going already. I just think publishing in journals, um, at least then you've got the peer review process, people are checking the data that you're publishing. And I think scientists so far haven't been afraid. So it was interesting, I can give you an example with the current project. They were funded by Shell, but you saw that paper by Michael de Klock just saying, deflating the amount of gas in the Karoo. So I think scientists haven't been afraid to tell people there's not that much there. So I think putting it in journals will ensure that we, we're being honest about it, but still making it accessible because sometimes science in journals gets lost. So putting it in journals, but then getting a, a real message across to the public and to companies, but a good question. Okay, and then I'm just going to end up with one last question from Anonymous. There are many questions coming through. So if you feel that you have a burning question that I haven't dealt with that you'd like to ask Steph about, you're welcome to email her. But I'm going to end off with one last question, a big picture question from Anonymous, uh, speaking about um, where you think the gas originates from, Steph. Um, so it's, from what I understand, and I did do Geology 3, but I focus on geophysics, it's, it's from the shale, so the shale is heated up and then this gas is trapped within the shale layer. So that is where it's coming from. It's not gas that's escaped from the shale and moved elsewhere. It's trapped within the shale. And I can't, did I say it at the beginning or did I say it in my practice session? We've known about this gas for a while, but we haven't had the technology to harness it and this ability to drill down and then drill horizontally. And so this is what this new technology is allowing us. And one, for anybody out there who's an environmentalist and loves the Karoo, the, the great thing about this horizontal drilling is it also means we can have one drill pad and six, sorry, like six horizontal wells coming off of this one well pad 
um, at depth. So you, instead of having six wells on surface, you've got one. And so I would like to, if anybody out there would like to join me on my business venture, <laughs> Grant, I don't know if I've told you it, everyone's complaining about how ugly these wells are going to look in the Karoo. Well, in South Africa, we've got cell phone towers that look like trees. So why not change our wells into windmills? Because there's windmills all over the Karoo. <laughs> so guys, we could make our millions with that idea. Come join me if you want to fund a kickstart campaign <laughs> to do that. But thank you, Grant, for hosting this. Great. And so uh, just to end off, thank you, Steph. Thanks very much for being the guinea pig in this, uh, this new format. We hope that the audience out there has enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us. Um, there are several little claps coming through from the, in the, in the live Q&A, so thank you, Steph. And uh, next week, we have a GeoTalk um, which changes subject completely by Kimberly Chappelle from the Evolutionary Studies Institute at Fitz University. And this is a talk entitled Growing with Dinosaurs, Getting to Know South Africa's Massospondylus Species. So please join us for that. We will send out the GeoTalk links to the normal distribution channels as well as to the GSSA. Uh, and thank you to the GSSA for doing that for us. And so we really hope you enjoy that. And we will see you next week. Thank you very much.